Good morning, everyone. My name is Jackie Jordan, and I work on the physiology team here at Volcano in sunny San Diego. We are very pleased to welcome you today to the first of our peer-to-peer -peer webinar series. Today we will be discussing how will appropriate use criteria impact your practice in 2013. We are very pleased to have with us this morning Dr. Bruce Samuels. Uh, Dr. Samuels is an interventional cardiologist on staff at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. He completed his medical studies at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York before returning to Southern California to complete his residency and chief residency in internal medicine at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. At CSMC, he trained in both general and interventional cardiology before joining the medical staff there. In addition to his clinical practice in coronary intervention, Dr. Samuels has actively participated in numerous interventional trials, including bifurcation and left main stenting, acute myocardial infarction, structural heart disease, and cardiac imaging. He is also working closely with the Women's Heart Center based at CSMC, working as the lead interventionalist of the active coronary reactivity research there. As co-chair of a 30-day readmissions task force, he has helped to shape policy for CSMC in its efforts to improve quality delivery of care. He has frequently been invited as faculty to many scientific meetings and is sought after speaker for numerous peer educational platforms. Dr. Samuels is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular diseases, and interventional cardio cardiology. He is married with three sons, and his outside interests include contemporary art and long distance running. And uh, of note, Dr. Samuels just completed the LA Marathon last Sunday. So just a few housekeeping items as we go forward here. You will be able to hear myself and Dr. Samuels. Uh, he is going to speak for about 45 minutes and go through the slides that you will see here on your screen. Um, at 45 minutes, we'll then take a Q&A, which will be because the sheer number of people, we have about over 100 people signed up for this, um, for this webinar, uh, a nice mix of physicians, administrators, and other healthcare professionals who work in the cath lab. We are going to be taking the Q&A over the instant messaging function you will see at the left-hand side of your screen. You can send those, those questions in to Dr. Samuels and I during the, the presentation, and then we will go through and shoot them out live um, to, to the audience and have Dr. Samuels answer them live. If you have any questions as we go along, uh, if there are any logistical questions, please feel free to send, uh, send me the Q&A um, on the left-hand side of your screen. So without further ado, to do. We will get going here with, uh, with Dr. Samuels. We are very pleased to, to have him here today and to have all of you join us from across the country. Take it away, Dr. Samuels. Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, good morning, everybody. I wanted to thank Volcano, first of all, for providing this uh, webinar and really paying attention to a subject which is so vital to all of us who work in the cath lab and especially uh, interventional cardiologists uh, dealing with all of uh, this new world order. And it's really forward thinking that they're uh, asking me to come and uh, provide this kind of information to uh, all of us because in so many ways this is the kind of information we never really get in peer-to-peer -peer kind of platforms. So I appreciate that very much. It's going to be a mixture of uh, historical information as sort of how did we get here and in addition to uh, these usual kind of clinical data that you're used to seeing and then some more practical uh, tips in sort of how we can run our cath labs uh, best. So uh, let's, let's get moving on and uh, talk about exactly uh, what it is we're going to be discussing over the next hour or so. Uh, my disclosures here um, are, are present on this slide. Uh, but what we're going to talk about really is how did we arrive at this uh, perfect storm? Because really what we're dealing with in cardiology now is in some ways uh, uh, really a perfect storm. And it comes to budgetary constraints. Uh, regulatory legal pressures, and an emphasis on quality metrics. These are all things which have been uh, in the background but have never really been in the forefront until I would say the last two to three years. And they've really all come together in a way that has rocked our world and made us um, rethink how we do things and um, how our hospital functions. If we don't pay to it, uh, attention to them, it will be at our peril for sure. All right, that's enough of the uh, disaster analogies. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, exactly how we got here. Well, the way, the way we got here, it's pretty simple. It's all about the money. Uh, the U.S. is outspending other countries on health care. 
If you look at this graph here, you can see the United States far and away spends more money per capita than other uh, similarly developed countries. Uh, this was true uh, all through the 90s and uh, the 2000s. And if you look at 2012, uh, you'll see that that number is up to uh, over $8,000 uh, per capita. So uh, if you look at uh, the amount of money spent on health care uh, compared to the GDP, uh, you'll see that it's rising uh, starting in 2010, projected up to 2050. The amount spent on entitlements between Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security will actually take up uh, the entirety of the federal revenue. So it's this kind of budgetary pressure that's really uh, driven a lot of the health care policy, no surprise. Uh, but it's, it's the kind of thing where when you look into the future, it gets even more scary. And so uh, people are struggling in Washington with how it is that they can rein in these costs uh, because they know 10,000 people become Medicare eligible every day. We're already spending 43 cents of every Medicare uh, dollar on health care. And we're going to now have to focus not only on quality, but also on the uh, expedient delivery of care. So if you look at uh, how much cardiology makes up of that cost, uh, there's no surprise that we are the number one driver. Coronary heart disease and stroke are by far um, the largest uh, both direct and indirect costs in health care. And the billions of dollars, we're talking about well over a two to $300 billion spent on um, our uh, neck of the woods. It, within cardiology, uh, there's been emphasis through the years on uh, various um, various uh, drivers of uh, health care costs, but starting in the mid-90s, it was uh, PCI and the cath lab that really caught everyone's attention. And that was because the rate of uh, procedures went dramatically higher uh, after the advent of stents. And you could see that nearly every other form of cardiac intervention, whether it was bypass surgery and arterectomy pacemakers, you know, grew at either a much, much slower rate or actually declined. Uh, this graph only goes out to 2006. If we look at um, uh, data since 2006, especially since 2009, the data is less robust because it's uh, usually collected way in the past and then uh, shown only uh, several years later. But all the data that I've seen shows that uh, cardiac surgery especially has really plummeted. Uh, and PCI itself has started to level off as well. Uh, but it was this uh, driver more than 10 years ago uh, which led to some of the current health policy um, challenges and policy. So um, it's not just the amount of money uh, that's being spent, but it's also the variability around the country. This really gets people in Washington a little bit crazy when they notice not only how much they're spending on care, but how different it is uh, between certain regions of the country, between certain medical centers and others. If you look here at a map of the United States, you'll see, for instance, that when you compare 1,000 Medicare enrollees and look at the rates of angioplasty among those enrollees, so this is not the total number being done, but the rate that, uh, at which uh, angioplasty is being done, you'll see really a tremendous variation. Of course, much of it may be driven through the health of the enrollees, uh, but there might be some other variations that are less well explained by the actual health of the people being taken care of. So in the Pacific Northwest and the Northeast, much lower rates compared to in the South and in certain uh, other pockets throughout the country. It's when you see that kind of variation that people start to uh, say to themselves, maybe we need to have a little bit of regulation in order to bring everybody more onto the same page. And so we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about uh, appropriateness, the necessity of intervention, and the quality of the intervention. And these are buzzwords that you hear all the time now, which we never really used to talk much about. Uh, we always used to internally have our own uh, metrics for these, but now we're dealing with external metrics. So the first thing we're going to talk about is appropriateness of care. And, of course, when we talk about appropriateness of care, uh, very graphically we've got the appropriate use criteria, which started in 2009. Uh, this was a direct response to the fact that the rising costs of medical care were felt to be unsustainable. And MedPAC, which was the Medicare Payment Advisory Committee, along with Medical Directors Institute, said we need to have more guidance. We need to bring uh, everybody in line so that we're all sort of doing the same thing uh, for the same indications. And it, the ACC took the lead here along with many, many other multiple uh, subspecialties, the SCAI, SDS, AATS, as you can see there. And they said, you know, let's not let the government tell us what to do. Let's have ourselves tell us what to do. Let's go through the data and try and figure out 
if we can decide what's appropriate for an angioplasty, what's not appropriate for an angioplasty. And as we all know, this led to a, a scoring system which started in 2009 but was updated in 2012. We're going to talk a little bit about this. Again, the doctors in the audience probably who live this every day, this may be um, old news, but I think it's worth going through uh, anyway for the exercise because as I go around and I lecture, I find so many of us who are dealing with it still don't understand the nuances of the appropriate use criteria. And for those of us who can master it, it's going to make our lives a lot easier. So uh, how is it that this appropriate scores came up? Well, it was based on RAND criteria. These are the RAND scores uh, for appropriateness for many, many different industries applied to the medical industry, uh, no different than any others, showing that uh, if you have a score between 1 and 9, and if you're 7 to 9, you're considered appropriate. If you're 4 to 6, it's considered uncertain, right? And if you're at 1 to 3, it's considered uh, inappropriate, not generally acceptable, and not a reasonable approach for that indication. So it's, imp it's interesting that in that first uh, article that was published about the appropriate use criteria, they wanted to be clear to say appropriate does not mean mandatory. It doesn't mean you have to do it just because uh, the score comes up and says it's appropriate. Uncertain doesn't mean questionable. It doesn't mean somebody's necessarily questioning what you're doing. And most importantly, inappropriate does not mean fraud. It doesn't mean that if you're doing this, you're performing malpractice. There's still judgment involved, and these are just guidelines. And unfortunately, um, I really think that this has gotten lost, and it's not a surprise that this has gotten lost because it's so much easier to look at black and white, to look at red, yellow, and green, and to decide that what we're doing is either correct or fraught with hazard. And this has caused... Uh, without question, a lot of the anxieties that we're living with. So let's uh, dive in a little bit to the appropriate use criteria then. Um, by the way, those, those uh, titles that we just spoke about, appropriate, uncertain, and inappropriate, those are now going to be updated in 2013. Uh, Manesh Patel and his colleagues have uh, decided to rename those because of sort of the inflammatory nature of the, of the terms, and so I'm very pleased the appropriate will stay appropriate, but uncertain is going to be changed to maybe appropriate, and most importantly, inappropriate will go away and will now be called rarely appropriate. And uh, this is going to be the case not just for um, appropriate use criteria for interventional, uh, interventional cardiology and PCI, but will be true for all appropriate use criteria. As you may or may not know, appropriate use criteria have been published for many, many other uh, of the procedures that are done in the cat, uh, both uh, in the cath lab and outside of the cath lab. And in fact, the first one that's going to be released later this month will be for implantable cardiac defibrillators. All right, so how about uh, the rubric that's, that's uh, used in order to determine appropriateness? Well, there's actually several variables that are used. Um, and basically, it takes into account on the top of the, the uh, square there, the findings on the non-invasive study. So non-invasive stress test is still a key component of understanding appropriateness criteria. On the left will be both the patient's symptoms as well as how much medication they're on. And on the bottom will be the coronary anatomy. So there are four variables that go into looking into whether or not somebody has appropriate, inappropriate, or uncertain PCI that's recommended. And this can be extremely mind-boggling to try and keep in your head all these different variables, of course, Nobody's done a randomized trial in somebody with an intermediate risk finding on a non-invasive study with class 2 angina on two anti-anginals uh, who has a non-proximal LED stenosis. Nobody will ever do a randomized clinical trial on that sort of a patient. And so the squares that you see uh, filled in are based on expert opinion. They're not based on randomized clinical trials uh, directly, but they're based indirectly on all the available clinical trial evidence. Um, with expert uh, consensus based on the committees that have looked at this. And that's appropriate. I, I'm sorry, that's important because previous guidelines that we have, class one, class two, class three guidelines, uh, were uh, primarily based on answers that could be obtained by direct um, clinical trial evidence. And the higher the clinical trial evidence, the better the level of evidence was for those uh, recommendations. This is different. This is uh, this is a different sort of guidelines. It's based on a larger volume of data, some of which is, uh, you know, the classic class A uh, cl uh, randomized clinical trial data, but some of it is, is much more um, a lower level trial data, and it's sifted through the uh, expert opinion uh, sort of uh, strainer, if you will. 
So if you look from the low risk, you know, very simply what you would expect people who are at low risk, meaning they have low risk findings on their non-invasive study on very little anti-anginal medications with very minimal amount of coronary disease, those are more likely to be inappropriate. And as you go to the right and you see people who have higher risk studies, higher grades of angina, higher levels of coronary disease are going to be more appropriate. Uh, you know, one thing that you can do to sort of keep it simple is to say, well, what if I have a patient with a proximal LED? Well, it's very interesting. If you look at the proximal LED anatomy on these rubrics and you draw a red line there, everything to the right is people with proximal LED stenosis. It almost doesn't matter. It does a little bit, but it almost doesn't matter what their stress test shows, what their anti-anginal regimen is. They're going to be appropriate or, at worst, uncertain based on their level of angina. So there are certain... Um, ways that you can get through the data or uh, through the appropriate use criteria. And you can see that clinical trials have shown very good uh, improvement in both morbidity and mortality for patients with uh, very proximal LED disease. So historically, we know those patients do well. Those will automatically uh, lead to appropriate uh, use guidelines. All right, in the next slide, uh, this was a great study uh, published by Paul. Paul Chan over in the uh, in J Journal of American um, Medical Association two years ago. And this really looked at the appropriate use criteria and said, uh, how good of a job are we doing? Let's retrospectively apply the appropriate use criteria to uh, over 600,000 uh, patients uh, utilizing the NCDR PCI registry that we all participate in. So they took all the sifted data uh, from many, many years, and they looked at over half a million people and said, let's now apply retrospectively the appropriate use criteria and see how good of a job are we doing. And this is really, in some ways, one of the most important slides I'd like to get across uh, to the people in the audience, because the answer to me is that we're doing a fantastic job. If you look at the uh, numbers of patients who, were, who received the PCI on the left side there with uh, acute coronary syndrome, which was 70% of the cases in this study, 98.6 of them were, uh, fell under the appropriate use criteria for appropriate. So this is, this is a huge, huge thing that we all need to understand that when patients come in with ACS, which is most of the time, angioplasty is appropriate, period. A very, very few numbers of uncertain or inappropriate PCIs being done in ACS patients. If you look at the right side of the slide with a multicolored segment, where you're dealing with the elective PCI patients, which in this particular study was 30%. Usually in most studies, it's a little bit higher than that. You'll still see that 50% of the time, procedure was considered to be appropriate. 38%, it was considered to be uncertain. And only 11% was it considered to be uh, inappropriate. But remember, we're not talking about 11% of all the angioplasties being done in this country. We're talking about 11% of the 30% of the elective PCIs that were being done. Now, if you say to yourself, well, who were these inappropriate cases? You know, why were, why, you know, how did it fall out? Which were the cases that were being done that were inappropriate? It's really not a big surprise. If you look in the study, what were the lion's share of the inappropriate cases? It was not the kind of cases you would assume doing all the time. These are patients who had no proximal LED involvement, if you look at the anatomy column. Uh, they were patients who were either a completely asymptomatic or had uh, very minimal amounts of angina. They had low-risk uh, low stress tests, either normal or, no or very low-risk uh, stress tests, and they were on absolutely no anti-anginal therapy. So uh, this, to me, was a, was a fantastic uh, piece of evidence that, you know, the lion's share of the angioplasty being done in this country is being done appropriately, and that the kinds of inappropriate angioplasty that we're talking about, that we're fearful of being watched, that we're doing the wrong uh, angioplasty, somebody's going to put a big red square on our, on our chart saying, no, this patient shouldn't have been done. These are not the kind of cases most people are doing. We're talking about asymptomatic people with low-risk stress tests or normal stress tests who didn't have any LED disease, who are on no medication. Those are not the kind of angioplasties being done every day. Finally, what they looked at was, you know, how how do these inappropriate angioplasties vary by hospital? And again, it's that, that variation which is making people a little bit crazy. Because I've been on uh, panels talking about appropriate use criteria, and I've looked at this data, I've brought up this data, I've said, why do we need to have appropriate use criteria? We're doing such a good job. And the answer is this slide. The answer is that unfortunately, even though as a aggregate we're doing a fantastic job, there are some hospitals where the rate of inappropriate angioplasty goes up to 50%. Most hospitals are way below 
but yet there are still some outliers, and it's because there are outliers that it makes people nervous. People, uh, understandably, want to drive care uh, to be, have more consistency, and that's really why these appropriate use criteria are here, and that's why they're going to stay. So uh, if you look at uh, the goals of therapy here, if you look at just taking the number of inappropriate angioplasties, remember I told you it was 11% of 30% stable PCIs that were inappropriate. That comes to about 3.8% of all PCI procedures being inappropriate, which, by the way, if you talk to uh, the folks that make up the appropriate use criteria that I've talked to on uh, pu both public and private forums, and you say, you know, what is the goal here? Are we supposed to have zero inappropriate angioplasties? The answer is no. You know, clinical judgment still has to play a role. There will be times when it says on the rubric that it's inappropriate, but you understand the patient, you know the clinical data, you still think it's appropriate to do that angioplasty. Go ahead and do it. Nobody's looking for zero. It's almost certain that they're only going to be looking for these large outliers, people where they're doing 30, 40, 50% inappropriate angioplasty. Whatever that number is, 3.8% is not it. But if we could drop that number just by 1% down to 2.8%, we could save over half a, uh, half a trillion dollars. So this is, this is big money, and uh, their goals are not just improving patient care, but also uh, reducing health care expenditures. So this is another uh, study I like to talk about. It came out just late last year by Co, uh, published in JAK, and this is a fantastic study because it really looks at taking the appropriate use criteria, applying them to the angioplasties being done, and seeing what happens to these patients as they go on uh, through their hospital stay and beyond. And it may not be a big surprise to you that if you look at the inappropriate category, patients who would have been considered inappropriate for PCI, uh, that a lot of them did end up getting revascularization, whether it was PCI or cabbage. But it was a surprise to me that on the appropriate uh, segment on the right, that of all the patients who were considered to be appropriate for PCI, there's a large segment in blue there that ended up not getting revascularization and ended up getting medical therapy. And I find this to be interesting because so much of this debate has been about uh, the paranoia and the hysteria about making sure that patients who are inappropriate don't get the PCI and get medical therapy. But nobody's really talking about using the appropriate use criteria to appropriately drive interventions. And this study did address that. And let's take a little bit look, uh, of a look at their outcomes data. This is a slide I made up myself because uh, they don't have this table um, in, the, uh, in the literature, but you can extrapolate it and put it into the table. And basically, when you look at uh, the indications on the left, the appropriateness categories of inappropriate, uncertain, and appropriate, and you look at what happens to the patients, by their, and these are their adjusted rates of death and recurrent acute coronary syndromes of three years. So these are pretty hard endpoints. And you look at their revascularization versus no revascularization strategies, you see several things. So first of all, maybe not a big surprise, that revascularization does not improve your outcomes if you're inappropriate. And it's nice to see that these guidelines, although they're generated through this RAND criteria, through expert opinion, really do actually uh, have a great deal of sense in them in, in the clinical endpoints that they look at. In fact, the revascularization group did slightly worse uh, with a 14.2% event rate compared to a 9.4% event rate in those people who were treated medically. Of course, there might be confounders in there, uh, but these were adjusted, and in the end, this was not statistically significant, but it does, in fact, show you that, that the guidelines make some clinical sense. But please look down at the appropriate category, and this is where the uh, study really gets good. It shows that in the patients who didn't get revascularization, they had a 16% event rate compared to the group that got the appropriate intervention only had an 11.8% event rate. And over on the right, you can see how highly statistically significant that was, down to 0 .0087. I get asked a lot about the uncertain group, and this is the only data we really have to look at, the outcomes in the uncertain group. And there was no statistical difference between getting revascularized and not getting revascularized, although numerically there was a large trend towards an improvement in those patients who got PCI. And for these reasons, uh, until we have more robust data, I don't think anybody is going to really in the short term question uncertain PCI being performed. It's really just that inappropriate PCI uh, that I think we're going to be uh, held to some standard for. Uh, but I do wonder based on this data and based on the previous slides I showed you, whether we also will be possibly held to standards in the future for treating patients who meet appropriate use for PCI and who don't get it. 
Uh, so I think in some ways this is a real great, robust uh, trial, which should give us all a lot of confidence in what we do in the cath lab. So you would think uh, that in the public relations battle, we would have won. We would have said, boy, as a community, interventional cardiologists are doing a great job around the country. We are providing fabulous service to our patients. We're actually uh, doing a great job. But in fact, uh, we have a public relations uh, battle a little bit here, uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. First, I wanted to talk to you about the uncertain uh, PCI. How is it that we can uh, improve our ability to, progno to prognosticate what's going to happen with those uncertain um, uh, yellow boxes. What do we do with the patients in which we're not positive which are, w uh, whether to do angioplasty or not? And if you, uh, you know, uh, Mort talks about this all the time. Uh, Mort's a great proponent of uh, physiology in the cath lab, and we're all becoming more and more used to using physiology in the cath lab. But this is really. Uh, where um, physiology plays its biggest role. It's not in the patients in whom it's clear that an intervention has to be done, uh, and it's not in the patients in whom it's clear that it does not have to be done, right? It's in those people in which we're uncertain, where we have intermediate lesions or discordant findings between stress testing and the anatomy. And if you move down from uh, severe angina, ACS, to asymptomatic patients, as you move leftward, from a severe uh, disease to a single vessel disease or, or a non-LED disease, uh, he fills in these boxes here with FFR and says, hey, just do FFR, and you'll find out whether or not that lesion is actually ischemic, whether that actually is something that's a, a more of a, a, prognostically problem, a prognostic problem for that patient. And in fact, FFR criteria has been built into the appropriate use criteria for these very lesions, the ones that are um, uncertain because of either the discordance between the ischemic testing and the anatomy that you see, or because ischemic testing has not been done uh, in the lesion in which you're faced, and you need to document that ischemia. So uh, we will talk a little bit more about that in the uh, necessity and the quality segments, uh, but I thought I'd introduce that here. Uh, once, we, once we talk about FFR and we uh, talk about bringing it into the cath lab, this was a fascinating study that was done in France by Van Bell and his group looking at almost 1,000 patients evaluated with angiography. I've never seen a study done quite this well. It's being repeated now in a larger uh, population. But uh, this was a trial in which they looked at the coronary anatomy, allowed the doctors to do what they were going to do after doing the FFR, but not, uh, and then uh, deciding after the FFR whether or not to change the therapy. So the doctors had to say how they were going to treat the patient based on the coronary anatomy, then they did the FFR and then used that information um, uh, additionally to potentially change their management. And what you found is that in the group that got medical therapy, 17% uh, of them, 17% of the 52%, um, I'm sorry, not 17% of 52%, but 17% of the total, uh, which was uh, obviously about a third of the 52%, ended up having their medication, their, uh, their intervention changed, either to PCI or to cabbage. And this goes to the heart of Coe's article, saying that sometimes we think people are going to get medical therapy, but we see this ischemia, and then we realize we have to do an intervention. Additionally, if you look at the group that was initially going to get PCI, uh, half of them uh, got moved either to medical therapy or cabbage, uh, either because lesions that were found to be less significant they thought could be treated medically or other lesions they thought weren't ischemic were and ended up driving the patient to cabbage. And similarly, more than half of the patients they initially thought would end up having cabbage uh, got moved, some to medical therapy, again, because of a lack of demonstrated ischemia, and some to intervention because of a lack of multi-vessel uh, 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 multi, uh, ischemia. And so what you find is that even though the overall numbers of PCI cabbage and optimal medical therapy changed very little, uh, there was a huge shift in which patients actually received which therapy. 45%, almost half of the patients moved from the initial strategy based on angiography alone to a different strategy based on uh, the utilization of FFR. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Um, well, we see this also in FAME. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with FAME and the landmark study which showed the uh, value of using FFR guidance versus our eyes alone in uh, figuring out whether or not uh, to treat lesions in the cath lab. But FAME-2 uh, then looked at taking patients who had low FFR values and randomizing them to optimal medical therapy or PCI. And this was just a fantastic trial for all of us because it really showed that in those lesions that are 
clearly ischemic by FFR criteria, they do far, far better with PCI. So this is, again, uh, the sort of drumbeat that we've uh, I've already said several times through this webinar already, that in patients in whom ischemia is demonstrated or who fulfill the appropriate use criteria for an intervention, for appropriate intervention, they do better with PCI than they do with optimal medical therapy. We have a lot of studies that show this now. This should, this should I'm sure, make us all feel good about what we do, uh, but it also shows that documenting in the cath lab not only appropriateness, but is the presence of ischemia uh, not, not, can not just uh, document appropriateness, but can also lead to better patient outcomes. If you look at uh, the FAME trial and you look at uh, patients uh, similar to the Van Bell study who were initially diagnosed as having three-vessel disease and those who were initially diagnosed as having two-vessel disease, and you then uh, say what happened after FFR was performed, uh, what you find is that uh, that completely shifts now. Patients who initially on the left were uh, found to have three-vessel disease, only 14% uh, remained as three-vessel disease patients, and the, whole, and the rest of them, 75% of them, were downgraded to either two single vessel or in some vessel, some cases no disease. Uh, well, not no disease, but no need for an intervention. In the patients uh, who had two vessel disease, again, 43% stayed for uh, two vessel disease, but more than half of them were downgraded to single vessel disease. So what we're finding now is that FFR can not only help to document appropriateness of care, but can also lead sometimes to the ability of the patient to stay in the cath lab, get that PCI rather than having surgery, or sometimes even being downgraded uh, to the point where medical therapy is an option. But very often with these multivessel disease patients, when you do the work of the physiology in the lab, you're able to treat the patient not only appropriately, but for better outcomes. All right, well, let's move on to uh, necessity and talk about uh, when exactly uh, PCI is necessary. And, and you know, this is uh, something that has captured the attention of the popular press and the media, because now we have criteria, we have some data, we have some standards, and because of that, uh, we're hearing a lot of stuff in the media. I talked to you, I told you we would talk about the court of public opinion, and this is something we just have to be cognizant about. We still have to do what's right for our patients, but we have to be aware that there are other people out there talking about the necessity of what we're doing. And uh, for instance, in Maryland, the state now mandates uh, necessity reviews now for every time PCI is being performed. They're using the ACC guidelines, the CAF PCI registry, and the appropriate use criteria. So these are now being used to watch what we do. Uh, I talked to you about this study about what a great job we're doing. Well, unfortunately, the, uh, this, was a, uh, this graphic didn't come from the uh, article itself. Of course, medical graphics are never in color and this pretty. This came from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but the title of the, uh, of the article was, Heart Treatment is Overused. Study finds doctors often too quick to try costly procedures to clear arteries. I almost had a stroke when I saw this uh, headline because uh, really there, nothing could be farther from the truth when you really look at the data. But unfortunately, this is the way that things are being spun. I mean, even if you look at Dr. Oz on his show, uh, yeah, he's a cardiac surgeon. I think uh, he in some ways... Um, sensationalize the information saying that stent procedures are used incorrectly up to 50% of the time. Now that quote, if you remember, the graphic from that Wall Street Journal article comes from the fact that only 50% of PCIs done in stable PCI were considered appropriate. But it certainly doesn't mean that it was inappropriate 50% of the time, even in the stable PCI group, and that was only one-third or less than one-third of the total patients studied. So again, the inappropriate uh, angioplasty was 3.8% in that trial. It certainly, uh, I don't think any of us uh, or any, uh, even non-doctors, non-physicians would say stents were incorrectly used up to 50% of the time. And I think that's important because we sometimes sift through data in a way that we're trained to do, but others uh, uh, like the Wall Street Journal articles and others are not uh, able to. And unfortunately, this has left us uh, vulnerable uh, because we have appropriate use criteria now, we have guidelines now, and people can uh, start to point fingers and say when angioplasty was appropriate, when it's not, when you did something right and when you didn't. And that's unfortunately a reality we're just gonna have to live with. Uh, we know that in Baltimore, uh, St. Joseph Medical Center was, uh, was uh, now under a, uh, not just a, um, a lawsuit, not just a, um, uh, an audit from a, from a um, insurance company, but actually all went all the way up to the Department of Justice and led to Senate hearings about the appropriateness of their stent uh, usage. 
and uh, federal ICD probes we know have, t have targeted physicians in the past. And unfortunately, we're not just dealing with our own medical societies and peer review processes. We're actually sometimes getting the Department of Justice involved in these issues. Uh, HCA, a hospital giant, uh, disclosed that the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami is investing the company. Why? Uh, because of the appropriateness, the necessity of doing cardiac interventions and PCI. Uh, the Department of Justice was specifically investigating, as I said, the medical necessity provided at any of the company's facilities. started at the, uh, the hospital in Miami, but it spread to all of their hospitals throughout the country. Uh, at Cleveland in Ohio in the heartland, uh, also looking at, uh, this is just from their uh, newspaper, their articles all over the country now about uh, patients, uh, patients, medical staff, uh, other physicians, uh, whistleblowers looking at whether or not a stent placement was appropriate or whether it was uh, necessary. Uh, if you look at, unfortunately, the uh, fallout, this is no surprise. There are trial lawyers who will pick up any uh, possible uh, reason to sue a person. And so you have uh, this uh, lovely named group in Florida called Unnecessary Stent Lawyers with their web page here saying, call us if you think your stent has been placed unnecessarily. And it's gotten so brutal that you can even see this uh, billboard on the interstate in uh, Pennsylvania, was your stent unnecessary? And uh, I, I, I'm sorry to say this is a real slide. It's not a, uh, it's not a Photoshopped uh, uh, piece of horror. So uh, let's talk a little bit uh, more, though, about uh, rack audits. This is something that uh, the administrators but also physicians have to deal with on a daily basis, although there may be stuff going on in the media and on billboards. Uh, this is the kind of stuff we're used to, people coming in uh, from Medicare saying whether or not uh, we need to uh, justify, I'm sorry, saying whether or not we need to uh, uh, give back money for uh, procedures or uh, medications or what, what have you that may not have been appropriately uh, prescribed. And in this case, uh, RAC Audit is shifting their focus now on whether a procedure was necessary in the first place. It was really not to do with whether the coding was correct, whether the uh, length of stay was too long, which we're used to. Now it's about was this procedure necessary. And so uh, necessity of intervention is something that is brand new in rack audits. It started with AICDs and pacemakers, but it's now moved on to uh, the interventional uh, procedures in uh, PCI and the cath lab. Uh, well, if you looked at the amount of money uh, that's come through these denials, uh, it's, it's staggering. $2.3 billion in denied claims just in 2012 alone, over 2,000 hospitals. 70% of these denials were due to insufficient documentation. 85% of hospitals will experience a rack audit if there are any administrators on the phone. Uh, I can almost see you nodding your heads. All of us have had to deal with this, and it's, a, it's a, just a dramatic uh, reality of our hospital systems uh, that we have to spend a lot of time, effort, and money uh, fighting them. So, uh, you know, is there, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Is there something that we can do to improve the chances that we can survive a RAC audit and uh, show that what we're doing is, is actually uh, uh, fulfilling the appropriateness? And, and the answer is, of course, yes, because most of the time it's just uh, tied to a lack of documentation. Uh, there's not enough diagnostic test results. The physicians didn't interpret the diagnostic test. There's not a document, uh, documentation of the assessments that led to those interventions being necessary. So, um, unfortunately, this fiscal deal, uh, the recent fiscal deal, gives the RACs even more time. They can go back in time, um, and they can look at uh, anything that was paid to you uh, four years ago. So this is something that's not just ongoing, but it's actually going to be retrospective, when some of the policies that we put in place in our own hospitals may not have been in place. But basically, you need evidence uh, for payment. What you need to do is you need to show uh, that there's objective evidence of myocardial ischemia. That's all you need to do. You need to show that the appropriateness uh, criteria, the same things that lead to uh, the appropriateness uh, standards are there uh, so that uh, you can just bring it to the face of the people in the RAC audits. So, uh, who needs to do this documentation? Well, uh, again, maybe not a big surprise that it falls on the doctors. Um, it is the physicians who document. It's therefore the physicians who are going to be responsible. And more and more, we are being held not just as partners, but sort of as, as sort of uh, an almost employee relationship. We have to be told by our medical centers, this is what we expect of you. This is what you have to do for us, because nobody can document better uh, than the physician whether or not ischemia was present, et cetera. All right, finally, in the last little segment here, we're going to talk about quality. 
um, and how it is that we can improve the delivery of quality in the cath lab. Uh, one thing I'm going to talk about, which is near and dear to my own heart, is the beginning of 30-day readmission concerns. Uh, this is something that uh, popped up on the radar a few years ago when uh, Congress decided that they were going to study 30-day readmissions, and CMS decided that because of this dramatic uh, amount of patients bouncing back, uh, that we need to reduce that amount so that we can uh, reduce the amount of health care costs, and we're going to incentivize people to uh, reduce their 30-day readmissions. And of course, no surprise, cardiology again is number one. Heart failure has always been the leading cause of 30-day readmissions. 27% uh, of Medicare uh, patients with heart failure will come back within 30 days. But if you look down at surgical procedures, vascular surgery is number one, but cardiac stent placement is not far behind. Um, so if you uh, look at the 30-day readmissions following PCI, uh, you'll find that uh, the, the rate varies anywhere from 10 to 15 percent, but it's a lot of patients we're talking about. And surprising to me, a quarter to a third of these patients after PCI go back to the cath lab. So a, third, a quarter to a third of the patients who come back into the hospital within 30 days after angioplasty will end up back in the cath lab. These are patients who are having chest pain, stent thrombosis, et cetera. Uh, if you look at the amount of money that the government is hoping to save, we're talking about as much as $12 billion. It's about 13% of the total admissions. And so there's a lot of money, and there's been a lot of emphasis lately. Well, uh, starting in October 1, 2012, many of you may know that one per up to 1% of your entire Medicare reimbursement can be cut if you fall below the benchmark, or I should say above the benchmark of 30-day readmissions. Uh, this was very real. Um, uh, if you look at uh, Ohio State, had to pay back $700,000. Mount Carmel Health System had uh, lost $400,000 in Tennessee, as much as a million, a million point two. I gave a lecture to the ACC Foundation in Las Vegas. Somebody in the front row from Miami raised their hand and said their hospital had to give back $4 million because of how much uh, Medicare uh, business they have there. So this is uh, really, really um, making hospital administrators uh, quake in their boots because we're talking about a significant amount of money. And, and right now there is an initiative to try as best that they can to improve the quality systems at the time before, during, and after discharge in order to reduce uh, the 30-day readmission rate. So what can we do in the cath lab? What is it that we can uh, say about these healthcare challenges and, um, and do in order to improve all of these quality metrics and to show that we're on the right side of every ledger. Well, when you talk about appropriateness of care, we already discussed that we have to improve the accuracy of lesion significance, so we have to document ischemia. Uh, when we talk about reducing readmissions, how can we do that? Well, we have to optimize our stent deployment. We want to make sure the patients obviously are not going to come back with a stent thrombosis or with some sort of edge dissection. We need to reduce vascular complications in the groin, so we need to set up systems in place. Uh, so that we do a better job of that. I want to document comorbidity, right, so we don't have any issues related to uh, renal dysfunction, uh, acute onset of renal failure after uh, dye loads, et cetera. And we want to improve transition and med compliance, make sure that our patients are taking the Plavix that we prescribe for them, uh, that they have the follow-up that they're supposed to get. And this last issue, even though it's the least sexy, is where most of the attention has been uh, paid for the 30-day readmission uh, um, problem. Well, if you look at uh, the specific issue of uh, stent apposition and stent thrombosis, and uh, I'm going to put a small plug in here for IVIS, this has been shown several times for many, many years. Back in, uh, you know, several years ago, the Washington Hospital Center published their data showing that if you did an IVIS after stent versus not doing an IVIS after stent, uh, your outcomes were dramatically better related to stent thrombosis itself. So we're talking about the 12-month rate of stent thrombosis dramatically lower if you did an IVIS after a stent. But look at where the curves diverge. They diverge right before one month. It's that 30 days uh, that you see the most dramatic difference and that that difference, no surprise, is robust out to one year, but the curve split way before 30 days. So I think this gives us all a lot of comfort to know that if we optimize our stent deployment at the time of, of the intervention, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're definitely going to be uh, reducing our 30-day readmissions. Listen, change is happening. There's nothing we can do about it. There's payment reform. There's lawsuits. The Department of Justice is getting involved. There are regulatory rulings. We have appropriate use criteria. That we have RAC audits. We have all this stuff coming down on us we never had. But unfortunately, as with most regulation, it's here to stay. 
uh, I don't think there's any question uh, that it's here to stay. But we can navigate the storm. We talked about that perfect storm, and this webinar is just one small step to help us all begin a conversation so that we can all share data, we can all share techniques, and we can all discuss what's relevant, what's irrelevant, and what we really have to focus on. Uh, we need to monitor appropriateness for sure, and we need to document the proof of ischemia in order to establish necessity in the cath lab. There's no question about that. But we also have to show that it's not, I'm sorry, we also have to embrace the fact that the quantity of the interventions being done is not really going to make our hospital profitable. It's not going to make us profitable anymore. What's really going to uh, be best for uh, our hospital systems now is what's, what's always been best for our patients, which is to do the quality interventions that optimize the cath lab performance and provide the kind of management which reduces the chances they're going to be coming back within 30 days. And finally, we always say think in ink. You have to d uh, document what you're doing. If you do that, you're going to be far less able, uh, I'm sure you're going to be far more able to withstand uh, the withering scrutiny of a rack audit, let alone uh, the kinds of uh, unwanted interrogations from uh, outside media, uh, et cetera. So here's the last cheesy slide to say that it may be a perfect storm out there, but we can get to calm seas. Uh, again, just remembering the buzzwords of appropriate necessity and quality. And I think I've come in just about at 45 minutes, so uh, I hope I didn't speak too fast. There was a lot to go through, and I get a little excited. But I'd love to take any uh, questions that you might have, and uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Dr. Samuels. Actually, we have had one question that's come up a, a few times. I'm just going to push it out to the um, uh, push it out to the main area here, and. Uh, the question is, uh, can we get a copy of the slides to share with our interventionists and other colleagues? And I'll take this one, Dr. Samuels. Sure. So uh, we, we, we do not have plans at this time to release these slides. However, we are recording this presentation and we'll be archiving it shortly on a website called beyondangio.com. Here's the link. I will send you this link. Uh, you'll get it in the next 24 hours. Um, and it'll, it'll might be a couple days just for us to, to get approval to um, make sure what those slides are, are uh, appropriate, you know, they're good quality um, and the, the entire presentation sounds good. So that, that's uh, one of the, the, the main questions we've gotten so far. Are there any other questions from the audience? I have uh, the instant messaging function maybe, up and running. Maybe, maybe I can add one more thing uh, on that same topic, which is that sure. um, Volcano has taken on, I, I think, a very commendable um, sort of physician education, administration education project in this arena. And w beyond just having the slides, if you contact either Jackie or your local Volcano you know, representative and tell them you'd like to bring this message locally to your medical center, there may be the opportunity for um, a, either a locally trained speaker or even an outside speaker to come in and deliver this exact same message to your CAF conference, to your, um, to, you know, to your uh, grand rounds. And I, I think that's uh, very doable. It may not be doable in every case, but uh, there definitely is a program. And um, if it, it makes more sense for, uh, those, for a speaker to come to you, I think you should uh, look into that because that's something that uh, is a new program and it's been very successful. That's a great point, Dr. Samuels. We, we did a few of these last year, and they were, they were uh, very well received, um, specifically uh, administrators who reached out to Volcano reps and wanted to, to bring a speaker in to, to go through this, what we're calling our functional PCI um, message. Um, and, and again, we're extending that for this year, so please uh, either reach out to myself or to to, to your, local, your local rep, and, uh, and we'll see what we can do to, to arrange that in your area. Are there any other questions at this time? All right. I think you may have covered it all, Dr. Samuels. Right. Is there any yeah. other parting parting comments you'd like to share with the group? No, no. I, I would just say spread the word. You know, this is the kind of stuff we don't talk about much in interventional cardiology. We're used to talking about the down and dirty clinical um, uh, stuff that you hear at TCT and all the major meetings. And we're going to obviously continue to do cl uh, great clinical research. Um, and I think the uh, the take home message is we do a good job in our in our in our subspecialty. We do a fantastic job, and the data shows that we do a fantastic job. What this is all about is about uh, creating the kinds of systems that allow us 
to not have outliers is really what this is about. And it's a good message. Uh, it's the reality of where we're practicing that we have to document what we do and show that we are not one of those outliers, that we're actually in the mainstream. And so, uh, you know, talk it up. Uh, talk to your colleagues, uh, to your administrators. Try and form a partnership with them. And educational initiatives like this can help provide a platform to begin that conversation. And again, reach out to Jackie. You can reach out to me. Um, you can look at me on the, you know, Google me on the, my uh, Cedars website, but uh, or reach out to your local volcano rep because this kind of a program is really terrific to bring to your own uh, local area and uh, begin that conversation. So thanks again. Dr. Samuels, I actually do have one question from uh, Dr. Orlando up in Buffalo. Hi, Dr. Orlando. Um, his question is, I have yet to see a patient preference play a role in PCI when it comes to optimal medical therapy or stenting. So I, I'm not positive exactly what you meant by this question. I guess what you're saying is that um, when it comes to whether we should use optimal medical therapy or stenting, that um, the physician usually has a better sense of whether or not uh, that should be done rather than the patient saying, this is what I want or this is what I don't want. Uh, I agree. I think most patients uh, defer to us in terms of our expertise about whether or not they should be getting a stent or they should be getting uh, a medication. Uh, the idea of doing optimal medical therapy rather than PCI is a little bit easier now, I think, with appropriate use criteria because you can look at patients who are extremely low risk uh, and say those will, patients will do as well, if not better, if they get optimal medical therapy. So I think we, we are more and more getting the tools since Courage, which was sort of this, uh, in some ways, unusual trial. In some ways, it was an expected trial. Courage said people in optimal medical therapy do just as well as those people getting PCI, right? That was, that was what was all throughout the media, but that was, in fact, not the case. Uh, Courage just showed that people who were randomized to an initial strategy of optimal medical therapy did just as well as if they had an initial strategy of intervention. We know that over a third of those patients crossed over to end up getting uh, PCI. But, uh, you know, when it comes to Courage, uh, a lot of us threw our hands up and said, well, you know, when do we use medical therapy, when don't we? And in fact, I think most of us have done a, a perfectly uh, reasonable job in figuring that out. But uh, the appropriate use criteria actually, uh, now with COE's data showing us outcomes data, we, we can feel good about doing medical therapy in patients who have low-risk ischemic uh, lesions. And I think uh, FAME 2 also shows us that uh, people on optimal medical therapy do fine if their FFR is over 0.8. So, um, no, FAME 1, I should say, and FAME 2 show that. So I, I don't think that uh, we should be necessarily asking our patients, what do you want? Uh, we should be using the data to say uh, what's appropriate and what does the data show outcomes-wise uh, people will, uh, you know, what are, what are, what are the procedures uh, based on the clinical data and the outcomes data that will show that uh, we should be driving our patients in one direction or another. So uh, I agree with you. I don't think patient preference is really uh, necessarily what should drive uh, interventions. It should be data, and uh, more and more we have data, and the appropriate use criteria, thank God, seems to really do a good job in uh, confirming that those decisions are, are the right ones. Any other uh, questions, okay. Jackie? Uh, there haven't been any other questions come up. I'm just going to um, show you here where we plan to actually archive um, this presentation, and you'll see the link here. This will be sent out. Um, again, this is uh, beyondangio.com, which is an educational website, and we'll be uh, having a, a hosted version of this entire presentation with audio. Feel free to share that with your colleagues. You know, organize a watch party for your interventional cardiologists. Uh, reach out to Volcano if you are interested in having a speaker come in, and we'll see what we can do. So if there are no further questions, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, this has been a great session, and thank you, Dr. Samuels, for your time. Uh, we are available for questions, uh, follow-up. Just send them to me, and, and I'm sure if there are any other questions for Dr. Samuels, he'd be happy to, to facilitate some email responses. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.